right, well, we're in the middle of our summer series on the story of David, how God took a shepherd boy, brought him through a lot of stuff, and made him the greatest king of Israel. How many know that our God can do amazing stuff? Only our God can do something like that, amen? And I believe that God has things in store for you that blow your mind, that God has you where you're at, he's taking you where he's taking you, because he wants to use you to make a difference. And uh, that has been so encouraging for me as we've been studying this. And I hope that as we've been going through this story, that it's been encouraging to you as well to see how God can do great things when we're faithful to him, when we allow him to lead our life and just watch what he does. Amen? All right, so this week, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. If you remember last week, we talked about dodging spears, how King Saul was out to kill David, and it got to the point where David had no choice but to flee, but to get out of Dodge. And sometimes we come to that place in life, right, where we got to get out of Dodge. Now, David, though, he didn't really have anywhere to go, so he ended up fleeing into the wilderness, into the desert. You ever been there in that part of your life where it seems like everything's going good and then you hit that dry spell? That's no fun, is it? But what I want to talk to you about this morning is the desert of development. You see, David, even though he spent years in this desert, God didn't have him in the desert just as a cruel joke. God didn't have him in the, in the desert because he forgot about him. God had him in the desert because he wanted to develop in David something greater than he could imagine. He was ready to position David to become the greatest king of Israel. But that pathway to fulfilling the promise that was prepared in the desert. So this morning, maybe you've been there, maybe not yet. But what I want you to do is I want you to be ready to embrace whatever desert you may find yourself in. Now, when Maggie and I moved to Columbia, many of you have heard this story, but when we got here, we came with four suitcases and a baby on the way, and that's it, all right? No job, no money, just a bunch of hopes and dreams and ready to serve the Lord. Um, but you've got to have a job to support your family, right? Forty resumes later and one response with a no thank you, we were in the desert. We didn't know how we were going to make ends meet. But through that, God provided and showed himself faithful, and he taught us a lot as we walked through that together. Now, before that happened, I'm a story of a desert as well. Before I was born, when my parents got married, they felt like the Lord wanted them to have a large family. There's four of us kids, so that's pretty big these days, right? And they felt like uh, God wanted them to have a, a big family and that the Lord would bless the communities and the world through their children. So my mom and dad prayed for kids. Year one went by, no kids. Year two went by, no kids. And how many of you know you're not getting any younger, are you? Year three went by, no kids. Year four went by, no kids. Year five came, no kids. In the sixth year, my parents gave up hope. They thought that God had given them this dream, that they would have many kids. And my dad and mom agreed, you know what? Maybe we misunderstood the Lord. And after going through the desert of infertility and the pain and the loneliness of going through that, they decided they were going to go to an adoption lawyer and start the process. The day that they went to sign papers to start, everything that went wrong could go wrong. The car broke down. My dad lost his wallet with all his credit cards. They got stranded in, a, in some town. They didn't even know where they were at. Everything that could have went wrong went wrong. But the good news is, nine months after that night, here I was. <laughs> Sometimes we go through a desert, but not because God's playing a cruel joke, not because he's forgotten about you, but because he wants to develop something greater in you. You ever wonder why that God has allowed you to go through that dry space? Why God would allow you 
to go through a desert time in your life? When things start to fall apart, when people start to leave you, when it just doesn't make sense. But sometimes God uses the most desolate part of our life to develop the greatest attributes that we need to be able to take hold and get to where he has called us to be. But when we go through these times in our life, we start asking ourselves questions like, like, God, why would you use this? Why would you use this as a tool to develop me? Or God, why, why am I going through a desert to get prepared rather than the oasis? Why would you keep me there so long? What's taking this promotion forever? God, I have been faithful. You promised to reward my faithfulness, but I haven't seen it yet. Lord, why haven't you delivered me? Or maybe you've even been to this spot. Maybe this is where you're at now. Like, God, have you forgotten about me? Do you still keep and honor your promises? You see, David, as he fled into the desert, remember, he was anointed by God to be the next king of Israel. But he wasn't yet appointed. And he fled the spear of a king into a desert place for somewhere between five and eight years. Five and eight years of desolation, of loneliness, of hardship. And he was promised to be the next king. A kingdom that would endure forever. How does that compute when you're supposed to be king, but you're living in caves, when you're living in foreign lands? So this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at what God did in David's life in the desert of development. So let's pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to look at a moment where David has been in the desert for a few years now. God brings him to this amazing trial, this amazing test, and he's going to emerge with something powerful from this. So let's check out what the word says, starting in verse 1. When Saul came back, after dealing with the Philistines, he was told, David is now in the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul took three companies, the best he could find in all Israel, and set out in search of David and his men in the region of wild goat rocks. All right, for the quiz that comes afterwards, remember this, wild goat rocks. You got it? Awesome. He came to some sheep pens along the road. There was a cave there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, here's the irony. Check this out, all right? David and his men were huddled far back in the same cave. Talk about irony, right? David's men whispered to him, can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemy in your hands. You can do whatever you want with him. What do you think he did? Quiet as a cat. David crept up and cut off a piece of Saul's royal robe. Now, that's a little interesting, right? So let's just back up here. David and his men are hiding from King Saul and his army. They're trying to survive at this point. So they're in this cave. They're doing their thing. They're being quiet. And what happens? The king's got to drop a deuce. And so they go in, he goes into the cave. Some of you guys were scared to laugh. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. The king's got to relieve himself. I'll use the biblical terms. Make y'all happy, all you holy people. Uh-huh. So he goes to relieve himself in the cave, and all of a sudden, the irony's right there. Can you believe it? Saul's the only thing keeping David from being able to rise up and take hold of what God's promised him. All David's got to do is sneak up behind him and run him through with the sword. Too easy, right? Too easy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I probably would have done it, right? I mean, if anything, just claim self-defense. You got it. It's good. But that's not what he does. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? He sneaks up behind this guy, and I don't know how you did that, all right? David had to, like, have skills because you're not sneaking up on me when I'm in that position. I'm just saying, all right? Cuts the corner of his robe and backs up. What do you think happens next? Verse 5. Immediately, he felt guilty. 
say, what? He feels guilty after he cuts the man who's trying to kill him's robe. He said to his men, God forbid that I should have done this to my master, God's anointed, that I should so much as raise a finger against him. He's God's anointed. David held his men in check with these words and wouldn't let them pounce on Saul. Saul got up, left the cave, and went down the road. Now, some of y'all thinking what I'm thinking, like, say what? You felt guilty for cutting the man's robe, and you've got all these men who are ready to go do your dirty work, and you do what? You hold them in check. Does that make sense to anybody else in here? Can I be honest? I don't get it. I really don't. But he holds his men in check. Why? Because he recognizes something. God had anointed him, but before God had anointed him, he'd also first anointed Saul. He chose to honor that authority. Most of us would have been like, okay, I don't want blood on my hands, but I'm just going to turn a blind eye here and let my boys do their thing. That's not what David did. Now, what's crazy is what David did next. Verse 8. Then David stood at the mouth of the cave and called to Saul. My master, my king. Saul looked back. David fell to his knees and bowed in reverence. He called out. Why do you listen to those who say, David is out to get you? This very day, with your own eyes, you have seen that just now in the cave, God put you in my hand. My men wanted me to kill you, but I wouldn't do it. I told them I won't lift a finger against my master. He's God's anointed. Oh, my father, look at this. Look at this piece that I cut from your robe. I could have cut you, killed you, but I didn't. Look at the evidence. I'm not against you. I'm no rebel. I haven't sinned against you. And yet, you're hunting me down to kill me. Let's decide which of us is right in God and that God may avenge me, but it is in his hands, not mine. An old proverb says, evil deeds come from evil people. So be assured that my hand won't touch you. There's a couple things that's just crazy right here. First of all, David emerges from the cave. Understand that the cave is a place of safety. Saul and his men did not realize they were there. David chooses to emerge from a place of safety to address the king. Secondly, is how he addresses the king. The man's literally being hunted down. And what does he do? He bows down and reverently, humbly, and honorably addresses this mad, evil king. Like something just doesn't compute, does it? And then he addresses the king, points out, I'm not after you. He doesn't rebuke Saul. He points out where he's wrong, but he doesn't go in a rebuke. He humbly addresses the issue and says, hey, this is up to God. I'm not even going to take it in my hands. Verse 14. What does the king of Israel think he's doing? What do you think you're chasing? A dead dog? A flea? God is our judge. He'll decide who is right. Oh, that he would look down right now, decide right now, and set me free of you. David understood something. In the middle of this test that God had given him, he understood that his life, his honor, his calling, his purpose was in God's hands. He trusted God in that moment because he'd see him do it again and again and again in the past, and he knew he would continue to do it. Not what I want. Saul, not even what you want. But let me just remind you, it's in God's hands, and he's the judge, and it's in him we're going to place our trust. How do you think Saul reacted? You think he picked up a spear and played target practice again? You think he decided just to leave them all? Verse 16, when David had finished saying all of this, Saul said, can this be the voice of my son David? 
and he wept in loud sobs. You're the one in the right, not me, he continued. You've heaped good on me. I've dumped evil on you. And now you've done it again, treated me generously. God put me in your hand and you didn't kill me. Why? When a man meets his enemy, does he send him down the road with a blessing? May God give you a bonus of blessing for what you've done for me today. I know now beyond doubt that you will rule as king. That's amazing right there. The kingdom of Israel is already in your grasp. Now promise me under God that you will not kill off my family or wipe my name off the books. David promised Saul. Then Saul went home and David and his men went up to their wilderness refuge. David had been in the desert. God was training and developing David. David comes to this point and has this test, but he emerges from the cave a different person. That person that David had become, that God had developed, it broke the heart of an evil and mad king. His kindness, his honor was enough to make the king weep and even temporarily repent. Now, I hope that none of us have to go through that kind of situation that David did for all those years, being hunted down, having to live in desert place and foreign lands just to survive. But when we're in the desert, God wants to train us. God wants to test us through trials. But then God wants to emerge us from that with a testimony of what he's done. So as we look at this story and we look at the situation David's in, if you're in the desert right now, I want you to take hope because if you're there, that means God's not done yet, amen? The proportion of your development is directly related to the size of your calling and purpose. If you've been in a long, hard desert, God's got something big in store for you. If you are willing to, to go through it, and you're willing to allow him to work in your life, God will use that to develop something of value and to prepare you to finally be in that spot that he has promised and anointed you for. So over the next few minutes, let's look at this situation. Let's look at what desert development brings in our life. First and foremost, being in the desert is an opportunity for God to train us. Desert development means training. God will use the desert to train his people. That's what he used in David's life. Now, it may seem a little odd. God, why do you have to take me to a place of desolation? God, why do you have to take me through that dry season? David had to wonder. He was living in the king's palace. He had great influence in the kingdom. He was in command of part of the army. He learned so much already. But there's some lessons you can only learn in the desert. There were lessons that David learned as God peeled back layer and layer and layer of his life and his heart that he couldn't learn sitting under the king's palace, but that he could only learn in the loneliness of the desert. You and I, when life's good, when things are going like we want, when we're on top of the world, we got everything and more that we need, we can easily become indifferent to what God wants to do in our life. We forget that we're not in control. We forget that what God has for us doesn't depend on us, all right? Hear me, somebody. If you can get where you're going on your own, let me tell you, that's not of God, all right? If you can do it on your own, that's only of you. God has to teach us something about dependence in the desert. Now, David lived in Saul's house before this. Did he have to worry about what he was going to eat or drink? Not a bit. It was brought to him. He was weighted hand and foot in the desert. He didn't know if he'd eat the next day. In the desert, he had to trust on God's supernatural power for just basic provision. In the desert, we learn to depend on God for our portion and for our provision. In the desert, David learned more than just about provision. You see, in the palace, 
David was surrounded by people who loved him, respected him. He had all the friends and prestige in the world. As a young 20-something, he was living life good. But in the desert, he found loneliness. Fleeing alone to live in caves. He learned to trust God for the right people at the right time. We've got to learn that too. Maybe we go through that season of loneliness where it's just so painful. Maybe we need to stop relying on our own good looks and our own charm and trust God to send the right people at the right time. David didn't have to worry about that in the palace. There was more that David had to learn in the desert. He had to learn to trust God for his protection. In the palace, David had a thousand men at his call at any time. He was able to defeat any enemy. He was under the king's authority and had the king's army as a protection. In the desert, he didn't have anybody initially. He had nothing but the hand of God protecting him. He had to learn to depend that God was in control and that God would protect him from his enemies. There was nothing David could do with his own power. When you've got the most powerful king in the land with all of his armies, it takes a supernatural God to deliver you from his hands. But that's what David learned in the desert. And of course, David had to learn something about timing. When he was under the king's roof, you realize David at any point could have decided to take God's plan into his own hands and speed the timetable up. We talked about that a little bit last week. He could have picked up the spear and thrown it back. He could have murdered King Saul in his sleep. He could have made sure he got God's promise when he wanted it. But in the desert, all of that was out of his hands. There was a different level of dependence on God, a different level of trust in God that David had to develop while he was going through this dry and lonely, desolate place in his life. You and I, we've got to learn in the desert first and foremost to trust and depend passionately on God. And let me drop this on you. If you can't trust God in the desert, how can he trust you in the land of abundance? If you can't depend on him fully in the desert when you can't do it on your own, how is he going to be able to trust you when you have everything and more? Learn to radically and passionately depend on him. God wants to train you and prepare you in the desert. The next thing in the desert of development that we face are trials. What are trials and tests? It puts our character, it puts our heart, it puts our abilities on trial for everybody to see. In these moments, we can either pass or we can fail the test. What's, what good is learning? What good are, is all the lessons if they can't stand up under the weight of real life pressure? When you're in the desert, God is going to provide you an opportunity to put that training into practice through trials, tribulation, and through testing. This moment we just looked at as David's in the cave is a powerful test that God allowed David to walk through. Saul literally, literally was the only thing standing in the way of him taking hold of God's promise. What a tough test and decision he had. But here's the thing. It allowed David to differentiate himself from Saul. If he wouldn't have passed that test, number one, it would have shown that he was willing to dishonor authority to get his way, just like Saul. If he wouldn't have passed the test, if he would have taken Saul out, it would have shown that he was willing to commit sin to get what he wanted, just like Saul. If he would have taken Saul out, it would have also shown that he didn't trust God to fulfill his promise in his own way, just like Saul. This test hinged everything for David. Would he be a really a man after God's own heart? Or would be he just be another good-looking guy like Saul? who was willing to do whatever it takes to get his own way in his own timing. There's going to come a time as you go through the desert 
Well, your character and your development is going to be put on trial. In that moment, you have to make the choice to stand strong in the, strong in the face of adversity, through the trial, through the tribulation, so that all of your training will be evident, so that you're wet, ready to take on the mantle of responsibility and weight of that which God is calling you to. Note in that verse 2, David passed the test not to take Saul out. But he passed something much more significant in that test. It said that David held his men in check. Did you catch that earlier? He held his men in check. Wouldn't let them take him out. David showed that he was ready for the responsibility of leading God's people. He was taking ownership. He was taking responsibility for the people who followed him. If you're not ready to take responsibility for the people who follow you, you're not ready to be in leadership. David showed that God had done something deep in his life while he's wandering through the wilderness. That God had done something deep and developed something much more valuable than anything he'd learned in the palace. But it was displayed on trial, in the testing, in the tribulation. God's going to train you and prepare you in the desert. God's going to put that character to the test in the desert. Because let me tell you what happens. When you receive the training and you pass the trial, you're going to emerge that cave. You're going to emerge from the desert with a testimony. You're going to emerge with a story of what God has done through developing you in his desert. David, he didn't waste any time. He passed the test and what did he do? He comes out of the cave. He could do it because he passed the test, and now he had a testimony. He wouldn't have been able to address the king if he'd done anything more than just simply cut the robe. He was able to do it in honor and humility with no root of bitterness. Why? Because he passed the test. He had allowed God to work in his life. He was willing to stand tall when the moment came. And he passed the test, and now he had a powerful testimony. Now hear me, somebody. When your time comes to get out of the desert, there's going to be people that say, you're not ready to come out of the desert. What do you do? You point to the testimony. You point to what God has done in your life. You point to how you have passed the test. You point to the testimony. When you're ready to come out of the desert and take hold of what God has called you to do, and Satan tries to tell you, you don't have what it takes. What do you do? You point to the testimony because you have been tried, you have learned, and you have emerged victorious. You point to the testimony and remind the enemy what God has done. What happens when you think you're not ready? What happens when you're getting ready to come out of the desert and step into what God prepared you for? And the voice of self-doubt comes upon you. What do you do? You point to the testimony. You point to what God has done, what he has developed, what, what you have accomplished and stood up through. When you go through the desert, you don't come out of it without a testimony. If you have been faithful to learn and be developed, if you've been faithful to pass the test, you emerge with a testimony that says they are anointed, they are called, and they are ready to take hold of what I prepared for them. There's some of you in the desert right now. There's some of you, you've got a desert coming. Some of you have been through the desert already and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something. God wanted to make sure that David's heart was still after him. Even though, even though he'd went through all this, he wanted to know that at the end of the day, David would still be that king with a heart after God. Still be a king that could rule his people righteously. Could still establish a kingdom that would sustain and live on. But he couldn't do it unless he took him through the desert. What I want you to do is I want you to embrace the desert, not out of despair, not out of anger, not out of desolation, but embrace it because you know if you're in the desert, God is ready to bring you and develop you into what he's already prepared 
and promised you. Here's the thing. The fulfillment of the promise is prepared in the desert. Some of you, God has called you to do great things. I personally believe that God's called all of us to make a difference. I believe he's called all of us to bring people to life, that God wants to use you in a real and significant way. But sometimes we get caught up in the desert and we lose sight of what the Lord's trying to do in our life. If that's where you're at, I want you to know if you're there, it's because God is not done with you yet. I'd be more scared about being in a land of abundance than being in the desert, to tell you the truth. Embrace what he's trying to teach you. Embrace the trials when they come because it's an opportunity to show that you've been learning what he's trying to teach you. And be prepared to stand on the word of a testimony of what you've been through in that desert. In David's case, he didn't ascend the king right away right then. He actually went back into the desert for a few more years. God wasn't done developing him yet, but God had really big things in store for David, all right? Eight-ish years in the desert, God had something big for him. But not once did he lift a finger against Saul. Not once did he try to take the timing of God into his own hands. The whole time he was through the de- went through the desert, he embraced the lesson. He passed the trials. He passed the test. And he got a new testimony every single time. 1 Samuel 31, 3 through 6. The battle was hot and heavy around Saul. The archer got his range and wounded him badly. Saul said to his weapon bearer, draw your sword and put me out of my misery, lest these pagan pigs come and make a game out of killing me. But his weapon bearer wouldn't do it. He was terrified. Saul took the sword himself and fell on it. When the weapon bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, and his weapon bearer, the men closest to him, died together that day. That's not the way we normally end a service, is it? Talking about death like that. But let me tell you why that's significant. While David was still in the wilderness, while he was still outcast in a foreign land, God made a way for his promise to be fulfilled. Not through David, not through his men disobeying order. They trusted God's timing. They trusted his development. And God took Saul out in his own way and his own timing. And days later, David was anointed king over the southern part of Israel and stepped into his kingdom. If you're in the desert right now, it's because God's not done yet. Continue to let him develop you. Continue to trust him and his timing.